if you're loitering out in the lobby, please come on in. We've got a seat here on the train and start here. A couple of things you need to know about this morning. Uh, uh, first of all, um, you, many of you are aware of this thing called the Ice Bucket Challenge, right? It's this thing that's kind of gone crazy on social media, and uh, the people are challenged to uh, dump a big bucket of ice water on their head, and this is to raise awareness for ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease, and uh, raise funds for the treatment and the research of that disease. Um, and so this thing has just gone nuts. Everybody's doing it. You know, celebrities are doing this. It's all over Facebook and everything. And so inevitably, I knew I was going to get caught in this uh, sooner or later. And guess what? You get to join me with this. Now, here, here's the deal. Um, one of our members, I won't say who. I'm going to say who this was. But one of our members um, did the Ice Bucket Challenge on Facebook and challenged the entire church family to do this. Okay? It's, it's not the end of the world. Don't put me like that. Okay? So here's the plan. Next Saturday morning, 9 a.m., all those star, star -hearted, stout hearted souls who are willing to do the ice bucket challenge, we're going to meet right out here in the parking lot, bring a bucket with ice, water will be provided. How about that? Right? Um, now, the reason, now here's the reason, and I would say, oh, come on, I've had enough of that. I, I, I personally am a little bit sick of it myself. But here's why we should do this one person. Hi, Gaddy. Okay? And Michelle Gaddy is just excited about this like you wouldn't believe. So I think, if nothing else, this is a way to show support for Michelle and Jim. Okay? Even though, I mean, I don't know, I, I don't look forward to dumping ice on my head, but, you know, we will survive. And uh, so anyway, you're challenged. You are hereby challenged next Saturday morning. 9 a.m. right out here in the parking lot, okay? Ice bucket challenge. Um, okay, now uh, for the story, uh, we are one week away from the launch of the story campaign, and uh, I, I, I read a quote this morning that I think uh, is pertinent to us. Um, I get some email subscriptions from people who blog and they write about what's happening in our culture and what's happening in the church and so forth, and I read those things just to stay current, you know, and stay on the edge. And this was a, a, a sentence written by a fellow named Lee Bellinger. And I don't need to explain who that is. But he said this morning, he's just pointing this out. You've, you've heard about this shooting in Ferguson, Missouri, right? right? Where uh, it's, it's become a racial thing. The cops supposedly shot this unarmed black man. Okay, so it's, it's erupted in controversy. And here's what he said. The killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri sparked events that clearly show how fragile our society is. I agree. Um, people are on edge all over the place. Our, our culture, our society's in trouble. The world's in trouble. Okay? And what we're probably, what one of the first things we'll say next Sunday is that, you know, the world is in need of a connection with the Creator, the Redeemer. That's kind of been lost. And so today, as we come together to worship, um, let us realize that we are, as, as Christ Church, we are the hope of the world. I've heard you've heard me say that the local church is the hope of the world. That's you. That's me put together. And um, if we can draw near to God and abide in Christ, then maybe we can shine this light that the world so desperately needs to see in a very unstable time in history. Okay, so that starts next week. Now, one thing about the small groups, right? Everybody is going to be in groups, 9.30 to 10.30. We had you sign up last week, starting last week. I put on my group description that I'm going to leave that we're going to have extra homework, you know, so you can come to group prepare. I think one person signed up. <laughs> I get the message. Right? I get the message. Right? So uh, with my teaching assistant, Rob Johnson, we went back and rethinked, re rethunk our strategy. And uh, I don't know what, is that, I don't know if that's a word. But we rethought, there we go, we rethought our strategy and we're going to cancel the homework. Okay. <laughs> Reading a chapter of the story is enough. Okay, I get it. I get the message. So 
don't be afraid to sign up for my group if you're hesitating and think of homework. I ain't doing homework. Right, that's fine. I get the message. You're right. Um, so, bottom line, if you want to sign, if you got one more day to sign up. The sign up sheets are in the back of the auditorium on the table. Um, the only thing you need to know are okay, if you haven't signed up, do so today. If you didn't pick up your book, do so today. They're on the table in the lobby. Got a couple of gals manning that out there so you can get your, your family's books. Get those today. The other thing you need to know is read chapter one before next Sunday. Like 12 pages, two pages a day with a day off. Okay? Pretty simple. All right, read chapter one before next Sunday. All right, now, a um, couple of prayer shawls. Uh, one is for Roger Morse. Now, Roger Morse recently had a, a, a what's it called? A, a, a a repair, uh, the Achilles tendon repair in the back of his foot. But there's been some complications arise from that. And uh, last night he was taken to St. Joe Hospital, Chippewa Falls, with some uh, um, blood clots in the lung. Pretty serious. Okay. So uh, we fired up the prayer chain last night, and I would ask you to kind of join in with that. Um, we're going to send Roger a prayer shawl, and also Sam Gunderson. Sam Gunderson is the son of Jerry Gunderson, who is the son of Gladys Gunderson, uh, our our family here. Uh, Sam is he's he's not he's not old. He's he's a kid. He had some heart surgery, and that has not gone well. So uh, he's still hanging in there, but we need to send Sam a prayer shawl. So you know the routine. If you're not familiar with the prayer shawl ministry, read about that in the center section of your bulletin. The shawl and the card that everybody is requested to sign is on the table in the back of the room. And, okay, one more thing. Okay. Because this is August 31st, right around the corner is the impact season. Wednesday night program, Wednesday night uh, outreach. And so we are in need of uh, some volunteers for this year's impact crew. Number one is kitchen help, you know, uh, serve, clean up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Not a lot of, uh, you know, don't need a college degree to do that. It's pretty simple entry level if you're looking for a place to serve. Um, we also need a preschool helper. The lead teacher on that group is going to be Kay Thompson. So you would be helping or assisting Kay Thompson with the preschool. The other position is Melissa Wychick. Uh, needs a helper for fifth grade. Okay, so again, these are not lead teacher positions or uh, lead positions in a group. They are assistant <coughs> positions. So once again, preschool with Kay Thompson, helper, and a helper for fifth grade, Melissa Wedge. Okay. All right, that's a page full of stuff. All right. We're gonna uh, worship God together right now. I ask you to invite you to stand up, turn around, shake somebody's hand, and tell me the glad you're here. Stand up.
helps me with the problem and put me on the line with someone else to try and sell me you know, the security card they have. You know, it's kind of fun. That guy spoke perfect <laughs> I don't know what that has to do with worship this morning, but other than the fact that I thanked God for his humility and for reminding me of what we're about to see. Leaning on the everlasting grace. And it is so sweet to trust in my bank. <laughs> no. To trust in my fellow man. No. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Amen. And to lean on the arms that created the world. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come here this morning. There's a little bunch of us in this room, and we come from many different directions. And I have no idea what's happened in everybody's life this morning, who has walked through these doors, who has joined us to come in here to worship you. But God, I just ask that you would help us to focus on you, to put aside the things that distract us, to put us put aside the things that the world says important, and some of them, sometimes they are, to varying degrees. But nothing is more important than our relationship. And some, so we come. Some of us have known you for years. Some of us, perhaps just a short time. Maybe there's someone here this morning who really doesn't even feel like they know you at all yet. But God, I know you desire our heart worship of you this morning. No matter where we're at. You call us to you. You invite us to lead on those big, strong, Thank you for this time we have. Ask that you bless this. Meet with us here. As we worship to you, as we worship you, speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
else can and will fail and save us. But we can trust in you. We can trust in your grace, your mercy, your sovereignty. Thank you so much. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. <laughs>
and my wife will vouch, lots of humidity. Still these soldiers were running, crawling, jumping, marching, shooting, doing push-ups and sit-ups, and lots of them. They kept the faith every day and with honor. On graduation day, we received a pamphlet as we entered Bull Field. It looks just like this. It immediately grabbed my attention with the words, victory starts here. I've been in class with Don a little bit throughout the past couple of years, and he knows that my thinkings are a little bit different than the others. And when I read that, victory starts here, I thought, wow, shouldn't that be printed on every Bible in the United States? Amen. The second thing that grabbed my attention in this pamphlet was the Soldier's Creed, which was memorized and recited by all 550 plus soldiers on that field in unison. I'd like to read you that Soldier's Creed because I think it's important. It reads, I'm an American soldier. I'm a warrior and a member of a team. I serve the people of the United States and live the Army values. This next paragraph blows me away. I will always place the mission first. I will never accept defeat. I will never quit. And I will never leave a fallen comrade. I am disciplined physically and mentally tough, trained and proficient in my warrior tasks and drills. I'll always maintain my arms, myself, and my equipment. I'm an expert, and I am a professional. I'm ready to stand and deploy, engage, and destroy the enemies of the United States of America in close combat. I am a guardian of freedom and the American way of life. I am an American soldier. Wow. I don't know about you, but I like to focus on that second paragraph just a bit. To me, that second paragraph could be called the Jesus Creed. Because Jesus always placed the mission first. He's never accepted defeat, even at the cross. And he has never left a fallen comrade. I don't know about you, but I'm glad he's never accepted defeat and that he's never left a fallen comrade. I guess it's back to that job and honor thing. You see, serving Christ should be an honor every day, just like the freedom we have to come here to any church and receive his communion. Before we partake of these gifts this morning, let's prepare our hearts and our minds to receive him. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Thank you, Jesus, for this time that we can come together to praise you in song and worship you. We thank you for our faithful Pastor Don, your drill sergeant, our leader that conditions us each week, giving us the ammunition and the conditioning it takes to be strong. We ask for your blessings on this communion. In your holy name, we pray.
bow with me, please, as we prepare to give back to worship. Heavenly Father, um, Ireland reminded us today that not everything goes just as we would like. But still, we are a blessed home. We are blessed uh, with the love of our brothers and sisters here. We are blessed by a God that loves us so very much. And we are blessed by the sacrifice of his son. Father, with the great blessings that we, we receive, there is a responsibility. And so we now give back a portion of what we have been given by you, by your grace, that we may further your work. Grace is not grace until it is passed on. We are reminded. So be with us now as we partake, uh, uh, prepare to give back a portion of your great love. been talking about it today. And by the way, as your drill charges, <laughs> reach in the parking lot in two minutes for PT, go. <laughs> they all look at me like, not going to happen. Um, one thing I, I forgot to mention, I've been reminded to mention, that don't let the walk for life escape your radar screen. You're reminded to either uh, get a form and uh, to participate in walking and gain uh, sponsors, or Maybe sponsor those who are walking. Okay, just want to watch you. Just get that reminder out there. So we've been talking about faith, 
And today we kind of wrap up this series about faith. And we said we all have a tendency to think that if circumstances are good, then God's faithful. God is interested. God loves us. And if circumstances are not good, then God's not paying attention. Or we did something wrong. Or God's angry with us somehow. And then we said that we're, the, the reason we believe, the reason we worship, the reason we pray is not what's, because of what's happening around us, because of, but because of happened 2,000 years ago. We said that the foundation of our faith is a person, Jesus Christ, who lived on earth, died for our ransom, and demonstrated once and for all for our God. We said that faith is the confidence that God is who he says he is and will do what he said or revealed or promised that he would do. And living by faith, we said, was simply making choices based on what God has said about who he is and what he said he'll do. And we found there was a difference between hope and faith. We can ask for anything, we can hope for anything, and sometimes God says yes. But sometimes he says no, not because there's something wrong with our faith, but because God in his wisdom, like a good father, knows what's best for us. And sometimes, we said this a couple weeks ago, that it takes more faith to accept a no from God than to acquire a yes from God. We can ask for anything, but we can only count on what God has revealed to us, what he's promised us. He said the bridge between hope and faith is what God has said his word. And God, last week we said that promise, that God has promised us mercy and grace in our time of need. It's every time, it's available every single time that we need. Now, What's interesting about this thing of faith, in, there, in places of the Bible, especially in the New Testament, it seems to say, if you just believe, or if you ask in my name, you can have every, anything you ask for. And today, I want to look at um, one of those passages that Jesus, Jesus seems to teach sort of a blank check, that faith is sort of the formula to get what we want. And then we want to look at the implications that God has revealed, what has revealed, what God has said, and what has promised, and how it connects to our lives. Okay? First, a little background to understand. We have to understand um, what Jesus was speaking to when he said these, these uh, strange things. Jesus spoke primarily to Israel, to Jewish people. And he said it himself, he says, I came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. We need to understand uh, the Jewish people were ignorant people uh, with, a, with a strange or no religious background. They were very religious people with a well-developed understanding of faith. Their whole history and their whole culture was faith-oriented. That's what Jesus spoke into. And we read statements that Jesus made about faith, and, and that can throw us off a little bit. And it throws us off by, mostly about the way we read it. For example, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, nothing will be impossible to you. Really? I mean, if you've been a Christian more than a few days, you know, that doesn't quite work that way. I mean, if you've had enough, you know, daring to go out and try, it's like, you know, okay, okay I, I think my faith is at least as small as a mustard seed. Okay, be gone, or be there, or be healed, or be moved, or what happened, whatever have you, and nothing happens. And we think, well, either I don't understand what Jesus said, or my faith is smaller than a mustard seed, or maybe my faith is not existent. We get confused. But what's also interesting is, is there's a shift in the conversation and the terminology as you go from the Gospels, the story of Jesus, to the epistles and the further in the, on the New Testament. What, what Jesus said about faith compared to what Paul and Peter said about faith is a little different. And here's why. Jesus spoke to a group who knew what faith was about. They had a faith background. Okay? It was a huge part of their history, a huge part of their culture. Paul and Peter, later on in the New Testament, wrote to people who were Gentile, they were Greek, they were Roman, and they were different in their understanding of faith. The Greek and Roman people didn't have the background of faith that the Jews did. And so as Peter and Paul wrote about faith, they didn't disagree with Jesus, but they knew their Gentile audience understood faith a little differently than the Jewish people did. That's why we need to take a close look at one of these passages, because you and I don't have the background or the understanding of the Jewish people. Had. Now, let's talk about how the Jews perceived faith. Let's talk about that understanding that Jesus spoke into. Number one, the Jews were in a covenant relationship with God. Okay, we said that we could do messages on all, all, all the covenants in the Bible. Covenants were like agreements, sort of a contract. Uh, covenant contained conditional parts that if you will, I will. If you will obey my law, I will bless your crops, I will bless your families, I will bless your nation. Then there were some unconditional parts. I promise unconditionally you will have this land and I will send Messiah. 
these kinds of things in the Jewish culture. And the average Jew knew that faith was restricted to the clear promise of God. They knew exactly what to expect from him. And in the book of Deuteronomy, the covenant of God is spelled out in detail. That's exactly what the Jews could expect from God. And so a Jewish Israeli person that was living by faith was a person that was committed to upholding their end of the covenant and obeying the law. And when we read in the Old Testament about men and women of faith, it's not about um, petitions and getting God to act on their behalf by faith. People of faith in the Old Testament were, were people who were 100% surrendered to the covenant that God had invited them into. Now, the second thing we need to understand about Jewish understanding of faith. Old Testament faith was always, this is key, Old Testament faith was always a response to God's initial action, or his primary action. Faith in the Old Testament was a response or an action in response to something God had revealed or something he promised or something he said. Faith never initiated anything. Faith never started anything. It was always a response to what God had initiated, what God had started. God initiated, man responded. For example, we know this, we talked about this a couple last couple weeks. Noah built an ark, not because you know uh, he saw water, he saw evidence that rain was coming. He's, he's because, because God told him to do it. Nehemiah read in Leviticus 26 that if Israel would return to God, God would bring them back to the land and back to Jerusalem. And so Nehemiah prayed that God would use him to fulfill that prophecy, what God had said. Old Testament faith was always a response to, what, to God's primary or initial action. See, if you look at the word faith as it's used in the Old Testament as a noun, something I have, something that gives me life, you'll find it four times. But if you look up faith used as a verb, there are hundreds of times. And you know, there really is no Hebrew word for faith the way we use it. It's always in, used in this way of believe or trust or follow or submit. There's not one Hebrew word that's consistently translated faith. The, and, and we're thinking, okay, Don, I'm glad we got out of bed early and drank coffee to hear that. What's your point? Right. The, point, the point is, faith for the Old Testament believer is not something you talked about, it's something you have. You know, my faith is weak, or my faith is strong, or my faith is everything to me. Faith was an action. Faith was something you did. Faith was a response to God's primary action. Now, this is very important. This is very important. And it's also very different from the way the average American sees faith. The average American sees faith this way. I have a need, I have a desire, and I'm going to pray, and my faith will cause God to, watch this, respond to my need. In other words, I'm taking the action, I'm doing the initiating. That's not in the Old Testament. Old Testament understanding of faith is that God is the initiator, we are the responders. And nothing has changed. God is still the great initiator of covenant. We, and we have been created. We are meant to. We have been saved to respond to him and what he says and what he does. Faith in the Old Testament was never something that initiated a response from God or an action of God. It was some, not something you had or used as a tool. Faith was something you did. It was an action in response to God in the form of trust or submitting to him or following him or believing him. I think there's something in us, I think there's something in our modern American understanding of faith that sort of wants to reduce God down to uh, something small enough to manage. I think there's something in us that wants to put God in a box uh, that, you know, it's sort of like a, weak, it's a, like a kind of power to harness. And faith is the key to that. Faith is the formula to that. But we need to understand, faith was never a power given to us to harness the power of God. Faith isn't the thing we need, we use to change God, because God doesn't need to change. You and I need to change. The faith was given to bring us into line with the power and the purposes and the plan of God. An Old Testament believer had no problem with that. Now, you remember the, the story of Moses and the Red Sea? God had led the, the Hebrews out of Egypt right to this place in the Red Sea where they were sort of, they were, uh, they were camped along the shore of the Red Sea and they were sort of trapped. There was kind of mountains on both sides 
And the Jewish or the, the Egyptian army came after them. Pharaoh kind of had a change of heart, so we're going after them, we're going to kill them all, we're going to bring them all back. And they were trapped against the Red Sea. And you remember God said to Moses, take out your staff, stretch it over the water. Okay, and boom, God parted the Red Sea. And the Hebrew people, wow, okay, there was a wall, it said, there was a text said there was a wall of water on both sides. They went through on dry ground, they went through on the other side. God said, now, stretch out your staff so this, the Red Sea comes together, back together, and boom, sure enough, the Egyptian armies drowned. I want you to look at the response to this. This is in Exodus chapter 14, verse 31. Well, and we'll put this on, verse on the screen, Exodus 14, 31. And when the Israelites saw the great power the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and Moses, his servant. See, all through the Old Testament, you find these two ideas together, fear of God and trust of God. They're all parallel. Wherever you find fear of God, you find the trust of God, trust in God. And the picture of Old Testament faith and what Jesus' audience understood, that God is powerful. God is trustworthy. I am with him. Whatever he says goes. It doesn't matter what he says. I'm on board with it. Not, okay, God, here's what I need you to do for me. <clears throat> to the Old Testament Jewish person, faith was never a tool but a response to the power and the word of God. They surrendered. They submitted their will to him. That's what faith was all about. And nothing has changed. All right. With all that in mind now, turn with me to Mark chapter 11 in the New Testament. Mark chapter 11 in the New Testament. In this passage, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem from Bethany, and he's hungry. And he sees a fig tree, which is common in Palestine, uh, even to this day, and there's no figs on the tree. And Jesus, uncharacteristically, Jesus looks at it and curses it. He said, may you never be fair figs again. Which is a little bit unlike Jesus because Jesus always had a purpose with, you know, for, with things he did. And this seems a little strange that he would just pick on this poor tree. I mean, it seems like an abuse of power. And so he curses the tree and they went on in Jerusalem. Some things happened and the next day they're on their way back from Jerusalem back to Bethany. And uh, let's take a look at this conversation. Mark 11, verse 20. Mark 11, verse 1. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. And Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. He said, hey, yeah, I kind of forgot about it, but look at that. That tree that you, you cursed yesterday, it died. What you said worked. Now, look at Jesus' response. Verse 22. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Um, I, I think this is one of those moments where the disciples kind of looked at Jesus and they kind of looked at each other and I see the connection, don't you? <laughs> no? No, you, you need it? I don't see it. Jesus, what did you mean? We don't see the connection. Here's what he said, verse 23. Have faith in God. I tell you the truth, if anyone, come back to that minute, if anyone says to this mountain, Go, throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Verse 24. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Sounds kind of like a blank check, doesn't it? Kind of like, it sounds kind of like God's turning over the visa card. The heavenly visa card. You know, if you really, really, really believe it, you can get it. Have a good time. And so, but that, okay, but that leads me to this place to kind of say this. Well, then if it really doesn't happen, I really didn't believe. Hmm. See, there have been times when I asked something and I really believed it was going to happen. And it didn't. That ever happened to you? <clears throat> Maybe I'm the only one with weak faith. 
happens for you. You know, no, it happens all the time. So is the problem that we need more faith? Well, no. Notice what Jesus doesn't say. He doesn't say have faith in your faith. He says have faith in God, and it will be done for you. Now, let's try to make sense of this. In other words, what he's saying is God does the doing. God does the moving. God does the miracle. God does the task. Now, here's the question. In light of what we've talked about in the last few weeks, what would have to happen for you to be absolutely confident that a mountain would move? What would actually give you the confidence that if you walked up to Pikes Peak and said, go, be thrown in the Pacific Ocean, God would do that for you? What would have to happen for you to be absolutely confident? Only one thing, if God told you to do it, right? That's kind of what we've, what, what we've been saying, right? We can count on what God has said, what he's revealed, what he's promised to do. You'd never do that on your own. That'd be ridiculous, right? Just go up and just move the mountain for the heck of it, you know? No, but that's silly. I mean, that's Jesus' point. What he says here reflects what the Jews already knew about faith and what we miss about faith. That faith was never something to get things going, but a response to God when he gets going. Which is why Jesus said, have faith in God. If he said it, he'll do it. And you think the dead fig tree is a big deal? There's no limit to what God can and will do when it's his idea. And you come along and pray along according to his will. So, cursing the fig tree wasn't Jesus' revenge on a tree for not delivering a snack. It wasn't even his, his idea. See, if we look in John 5, and Jesus said, The Son, he's talking about himself, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing. And so that means this. The reason Jesus healed people is because the Father told him to. The reason Jesus fed thousands and raised the dead is because God told him to. And the reason Jesus cursed the fig tree is because the Father told him to. And that's why Jesus' response to their amazement is, um, guys, just do what I did. Have faith in God. When he tells you to do something, when he makes you a promise and you believe he's able to do it, that mountain is coming up and it's going into the ocean. It's not faith that moves mountains. God moves the mountains. Faith carries out what God begins, what he initiates, what he commands. Now, something else here that's kind of easy to miss. Look at verse 24 again, Mark 11, 24. Remember, remember he said just a verse ago, and when, if anyone says to this mountain, now look at what he says. And when you, when you stand praying, he changes anyone to you. When you stand praying, Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you receive it. It'll be yours. See, it could be here that Jesus gives his disciples a heads up, maybe a picture of things to come. That he later would trust these guys with this awesome power of the Holy Spirit that wasn't entrusted to just anybody at that time. That would enable them to heal people at will, be bitten by snakes and not be injured, to pray friends out of jail. They could ask for anything that would be done. Not because they discovered the formula to move the mountains with their faith, but because they had sought God and they would seek God until they knew his will and they were surrendered 1,000% to the will of God. And acting in faith, they would use the power of God, not for their own purposes, but to advance his kingdom. And so we can, we can sum it up this way. Faith is not about moving God, but about moving with God. Faith is the confidence that God is who he says he is, and will do what he's promised, or revealed, or said, he will do. And faith is acting on that, giving ourselves over to God as he has revealed and what he has said and what he has promised he will do when we do that. Our responsibility is to respond in faith and trust and act on what we know he's revealed. Okay. 
So then I think the question kind of drifts back to this. Then how do I know what God has said for me to do? How do I know what God has revealed for me to act on? Well, that's the question. And last week, we said we can count on two things. Remember what they were? One was the first one is M word. Mercy. And the other one was grace. grace. We can count on those things every single time when we have a need. While God sometimes does intervene and helps us externally, he's promised to help us internally. And so, with the Old Testament understanding of faith in mind, which is faith is a response to what God starts, and first defined by the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, you know, it's Hebrews chapter 12, let us then throw off everything that hinders and the sin that tangles us up and fix our eyes on Jesus. Remember that? We talked about that a couple weeks ago. And then Paul in Galatians 2 says, I no longer live but the Son of God, but Christ lives in me. I live by what? By faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's take a look for just a minute at a verse that we just touched on last week and we've seen a few times in the last couple of years. Here it is. John 15, verse 4. This is something God has said, something God has revealed, and something God promised. Remain in me, or abide in me, and I will remain or abide in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must re remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Here's the thing. Reminder, God has initiated. God has spoken. And he's invited something, and he's promised something. And faith responds to what God offers and what God has said instead of what I choose, or what I think is best. This verse, abide in me, Jesus said, I will abide in you. It's the equivalent of saying to Moses, go to Pharaoh. What? Go to Pharaoh? They don't want a man there. They'll kill me there. Go to Pharaoh. Tell him to let my people go. And I will be with you. Ah. Oh. I don't want to do that. I can't do that. I can't talk. Go to Pharaoh. Tell him to let my people go. And I will be with you. Oh. It's the equivalent of saying to Moses, All right, you're trapped. Your people are trapped. Don't cry out to me. Stretch your, hand, stretch your staff over the water. And I will part it. It's the equivalent of God saying to Joshua, I want you to march around this impregnable, unimpregnable, unassailable city of Jericho seven times. But God, we've got these new things called artillery. No, 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 no. March around the city seven times. Well, what good is just march around the city seven times? So in faith, Joshua took the armies of Israel and marched around Jericho, these huge, you couldn't get in there. Seven times, what happened? To the walls. They fell. It's the equivalent of God saying to Joshua later, tell the priests that are carrying the Ark of the Covenant to step into the Jordan River, which was, by the way, a flood stage. And I will get you across. Remember what happened? The priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant stepped into the river and the water backed up, like behind an invisible dam. And the Hebrew people went across the river. And to, to us, he said, if you abide in me, if you live in me, if you remain in me, if you let me love you as you are, if you let me forgive you, if you trust me, if you follow me, if you let me direct your every step, then I will live in you. Here it is. God has revealed something. God has spoken something. He's promised something. Can we respond in faith? God has invited you to live in Christ. 
to, which is to allow, to move into Christ, allow him to live his life in your space, to give over your time and your energy and your possessions and your relationships, everything about you, to his leadership, to his direction, to his kingdom. And the promise, the stated promise, the stated revelation of God is not that you will be very religious. Not that you will be in church five nights a week. Not that you, not that you won't have any fun anymore. Fun is sin. Fun is evil. Not that at all. The promise is I will abide in you. That when people watch your life, that when people watch and see your choices, they won't see you. They'll see him. That your life and my life are meant to be revelations of the character of God. You know what? Let's, let's just be honest for a minute. That's terrifying. Isn't it? It's something that's both terrible and wonderful at the same time. Terrible because it's hard to give up control. Come on, let's be honest. It's hard to give up control. I mean, even if we're sick of living our own lives, at least it's familiar. <laughs> right? Right? At least I know my way around in my miserable life. <laughs> Walk with Jesus. No, I don't think so. Abide in Jesus, give him a no. That is too scary. See, it's the same thing happened to the Hebrews when they followed Moses out of Egypt. Praise God, we're not slaves anymore. Woo, hallelujah. Way to go, Moses. You the man. Then they got out in the desert. And there's no water out there. And there's no figs out there. And there's no onions out there. And there's all the, and there's no, none of that Egyptian cuisine out there, and they're all going, we want to go back to Egypt. At least we had food to eat back there. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What happened to the adventure? No, we want to go back to Egypt. At least it's familiar. Just wandering in the desert following a God, I don't think we can do it. We're the same way, folks. We're the same way. Amen. We are the same way. I hear so many people, when faced with a choice of, really, faith about following Jesus in this situation is making that choice. And people at that point back off and they say, I can't do that. See, when it actually comes down to living by faith, it's kind of terrifying. It is also exactly what God has in mind for you and I and for his church. It's also exactly what our world needs to see. But... No, what if I fail? What if I make a mistake? God says, I got that covered. I said it. I promised it. In all things I work for good to those who are called to my purpose. So I'm covered? Yeah, you're covered. You make a mistake, you fail. I'll bring good out of it. Wow. So it's terrible, but it's also wonderful. Because our life can be more than just about our life. The Lord of the universe will live in us. And our life will be part of the mission of God to redeem human lives from deception and death. The question is not will he do it. He said he would. He said he would, so we can count on it. So faith is not about moving God. About, oh, please God, would you do this for me? Please God, would you do this? We can ask for anything now. But faith is not about believing that God will do whatever we ask him. Faith is about moving with God because we're confident he will do what he said he would do. So the question is, are we going to do that? Are we going to respond and act in faith? Hmm. See, the application is that can we kind of put our will down? We want, kind of get, we want to kind of get God in on. We want to kind of get God in on our program and bless our plans and bless my, my purposes and my agenda. Can we kind of put that down and say, God, um, okay, I get it. I want to discover your will, as terrifying as it might be, but I want to follow. Because I understand that's what honors you and that's what pleases you. And so responding in faith is an honest and courageous response to the question, what's your next step? Because everybody has a next step. Everybody does. Some of us need to receive Christ for the first time. And not just believe in God, but actually make this personal cross the line and say, okay, God, I surrender. I can't save myself. I can't fix my life. 
I can only receive your forgiveness and trust you to lead me. <clears throat> call you King and Lord of my life. Some of you need to do that. Some of you need to deal with some stuff in your life that you've kind of held on to. And it's in the way, and you know it. Some of you need to start, you know, reading your Bible and praying at home and quit counting on just Sunday morning to fill you up. Some of us need to get involved in some community. And you, oh, I'm involved. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm involved in this small group, but really it's kind of safe and it's harmless and you laugh a lot and you have a good time and you love, you love those people, but nobody really knows you there. Not really. For some of us, it's time to make a choice to get under the hood for our life with somebody else. And I think for a lot of us, it's just, okay, I'm going to turn the whole steering wheel over to God. I've kind of kept it here and here. I'm going to let him direct my path every day. Every day I'm going to get up and turn this over. Because every day I get up, I'm tempted to be the king of my own life. And faith turns it over and says, you lead. You prompt. You tap me on the shoulder. And in faith, I will follow. So what I want to do, I, just, I want to invite you to stand. And we're not going to do PT. We're not going to do that. Um, <laughs> Um, I invite you to stand, and I would just, I would, uh, just pray together <clears throat> with this realization that I've done my homework right for what faith is. I just want to pray for all of us that we'll do, that's exactly what we'll do. That we'll respond to this simple thing that we've talked about so much over the last couple of years. By true biblical. God, uh, perish in us the American understanding of faith. And it's not that we're disappointed or disgusted with America. America is a fine place. But we acknowledge that some of our thinking, our independent search for happiness thinking, is not always biblical. And it's not always true faith the way the scriptures describe faith. God, we, we, we know that, I mean, we, we, if we've been around this for a while at all, we know that you know better than us. And uh, we, we appreciate the idea that we can ask for anything we want to ask for, but we kind of get in the habit of that. And, you know, we kind of pull back from asking you what your will is for us because we're not sure we want to do that. We're not sure we have the courage of the, the, the faith to walk that path. But yet you've given us a promise. You have spoken. You have revealed something to us. That if we will move your way and abide in you, kind of leave our old life behind and take the steps necessary, whatever that, whatever that means, that you will abide in us. God, that's an awesome promise. That's exactly what our community needs to see. The Lord God abiding in his people. Let's see the fruit of the Spirit overflowing to every day. So God, wherever we are today, whatever our next step is, that's going to take some faith and some trust in you to step that way. May we step with the confidence that you are who you say you are. And you will do what you've promised to do. Lord, give us the courage to make faithful choices today. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone agree to say Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here. I got that picture.